side, uh, myself included, but we are taking time out to uh, learn a little bit more, and I appreciate your diligence. This is the third public work workshop for the Westlake COD project that the RDA has undertaken in coordination with Dyer and Munster. So it was right Munster. this, that was the, uh, that was tonight the trajectory Tonight is Munster Dyer uh, on Thursday. If you really love this stuff, they'll be in Hammond at 6 p.m. where, Sherry? At uh, Kenwood, Kenwood Elementary. Elementary. Kenwood Elementary. So if you like it, you can go there as well. But tonight is just Munster Dyer. And what are we gonna look at? Well, we're gonna recap what we've done uh, as a group here, because I see a lot of familiar faces over the last two previous public meetings. And what uh, FAR Associates have done is put together a draft regulating plan, kind of a framework for what uh, land use could be. I want to emphasize could be. What you're going to see here isn't going to change anything on your property, your neighbor's property, or anybody's property. This is kind of like uh, a vision, an idea. And just like you talk about an idea around the kitchen table or anywhere else, Ideas change as you ask good questions and they, they evolve, right? So what you're gonna see is the starting point of a conversation about what could or could not happen around the station areas uh, here in Munster and in Dyer. And that conversation will take place in Hammond on Thursday night as well. So if you have questions about track alignment, you know, there's not an appropriate person here. I don't think anybody from Mickey is here. I to see answer. Cassandra. Okay, Cassandra. She's right over there. Sorry. Raise your hand, please, Cassandra. She's from Mickey. All right. So track alignment. Why is the station going here? Those those kind of questions. I don't mean to punt them, but Cassandra is the appropriate person to answer those. Land use questions. What could happen? How do they come to the conclusions? That's going to be uh, Far Associates and the staff here. And that is, can be a conversation. It should be a conversation that happens here. So I, I really appreciate your time. I'd like to take a moment to uh, call out Councilman uh, Mr. Nellens, Mr. Simonetto here from Munster. Mr. Deputy, anybody from? Yeah, my colleague Mary Tannis is in the back of the room. All right, so we're here. Uh, would you like to say anything? Nothing else. All right. All right. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't really know if I have anything to add to that, Dustin. You made my job pretty easy. Sorry to but see that's, you. no, that's okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sherry Ziller. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the um, Regional Development Authority. Very glad to be with you all. Um, so let me just kind of just reiterate just really quick what, what Dustin had said. So Doug Farr from Farr Associates, he's going to walk us through primarily three things. It's going to be the preferred TOD vision for the two stations that we're talking about today, the Munster Ridge Station and then the Munster Dyer Station over at Main Street. And then we're going to talk about the recommended zoning framework that Dustin just talked about that'll help facilitate the TOD in your communities. And lastly, Doug will walk us through the, uh, the next steps. And then what we really want to do is we do want to hear from you. We will have the boards around the room and we're going to post it so this is the last of the public meeting of this kind that we're going to have for a while so we do want to we do want your feedback so one way to do that is with the post-its around the room we also have a website that i think everyone's familiar with we'll put the web address up here shortly and you can enter comments that way so without further ado i would like to ask doug Farr from fire associates to come up here and he is going to walk us through uh, a presentation and we're here till eight o'clock and your presentation should last about 45 to 50 minutes about shorter i hope hopefully shorter, shorter. Yeah. and then we'll have a chance to have an actual open house and then uh, we can talk about everything that doug's going to enlighten us with so doug sherry thank you good evening everybody how we doing it's a pleasure to see you it's a quiet night can you hear me i've uh, my meeting started at 7.30 this morning, so I wasn't counting on not having micro magnification, but I will do my best. Maybe I'll move back here. Is this a little better? Can you hear me a little better here? Close this door. All right. So thank you for coming. Um, let me just show you some stuff. So uh, introductions we have uh, done. Um, I think everyone that needs to be introduced formally has been introduced. Uh, welcome to each other. Um, we're going to spend about 30 minutes, maybe not that long, going over the preferred TOD or Transit Oriented Development Plan for the two stations we're talking about tonight. We're going to talk about what's called the preferred zoning framework, and I'll explain what that is, which is how the land uses around the station might be regulated in the future. None of this is regulatory now. None of it is 
binding now, but this is an, an important part of the application, the, what's called the New Starts application to receive funding uh, to be able to pay to build the train. Um, and then next steps, and then we'll just, we'll be here to answer your questions till eight o'clock. So um, many of you have heard this before, so my apologies for the repetition, but I think it's helpful to say we are, we Far Associates are the sort of top, uh, top firm mentioned there. <clears throat> we have a team of three other uh, firms that we work with. Um, G.B. Arrington is a specialist from Portland, Oregon, whose expertise is about New Starts applications, that is to say, Northwest Indiana and the Westlake Extension competes with places like Charlotte, North Carolina, San Diego, California, uh, Denver, Colorado, all of the cities around the country that want new rail lines, we compete for that. So if you want to get it, you have to compete and do well. And there are sort of, there's good advice on how to do that. And that's what GB has help, been helping us with. Strategic Economics is a firm based in Berkeley, California, and their expertise is in market analysis, predicting what the market wants to do in a given location. Um, and so they've been our market analyst. You'll see the results of their work. And then finally, Sam Schwartz Engineering is a engineering and uh, transportation planning firm uh, based in New York, but we're working with their Chicago office. So those are the four firms involved, and I think we've got the necessary expertise to bring something forward that's really good. So um, four stations, I don't know if you can see that very well. Can we turn these lights off? Would anyone object if we did that? Just I think the contrast would help. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, so any four stations, Two we're talking about tonight, which are Munster Dyer, and then Munster Ridge, and then Thursday night South Hammond, and then the Hammond Gateway Station. Our role, our team's role, is to do three things, which is to create the TOD, or Transit-Oriented Development Plans, that we'll be presenting to you tonight, and what are called Urban Design Guidelines, which is, uh, it's one thing to show in 2D, a two-dimensional plan, this is what the 3D looks like. When it's built out, what, what character and form does it have? Second is to seek and incorporate community input. We've been doing that for seven months now, and we will do it again tonight. So the plans you're gonna see, I'm sure will change based on your comments. I'm not sure what your comments will be, but we are here to listen and make those adjustments. And then finally, to strengthen NICDI's New Starts applications. And this is a case where the RDA is working closely with NICDI and their consultant HDR on aligning the, trans the rail plans and the land use plans together. So, and then your role tonight is to provide feedback, and we've got three different ways to do that, you'll see. So one is to talk just one-on-one -on -one with any of us that are here, and the experts, whatever, the people will identify themselves after the presentation. Second is to leave post-it notes. We're pinning up in the back uh, the boards of everything you'll see, the plans. You can leave post-it notes with written notes to say, I don't like this, or I'm mad at you for that, or this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, or whatever you're gonna say. Uh, and that will leave that written record. And then finally, as Sherry said, the website is open for business and we'll, we'll receive comments if for some reason you think of something later or there's someone that isn't here tonight that you think would like to make a comment, that would be the way to do it. And there's the website, westlaketod.civicpage.com. And do we have our business cards? Not sure? Okay, Grant, question. Well, we'll find out. So um, the overall timeline, you know, the EIS process, sort of hard to see these things, but basically, there's an EIS environmental impact statement. We're in the TOD planning phase, which basically wraps up pretty soon. And then once that goes in, and assuming the New Starts uh, program is funded for the Westlake Extension, then there's implementation that happens. And this, I can't see any years here, but I know that 2022 is the uh, kind of preferred start date, the optimal start date for the beginning of what's called revenue operations, or that is to say the trains start running, right? So 2022 would be five years. Um, in terms of the public workshops, the work we've been doing, we've had three workshops. And has anybody been to the prior workshops in this room, right? I saw a lot of familiar faces. Thank you for coming back. Um, so this is our third and kind of final. The two were more workshops. This is more of an open house, a listening session. Um, and so there, that's where we are tonight. So preferred TOD visions. I'm going to give you a little setup, and then I'm going to ask Allie, who actually did the drawings and knows them really well, to explain the schemes to you, and, and we'll go back and forth a little bit. But first off, this is kind of a, a, a framing or an explanation of what you're gonna see. So these, uh, the drawings we're showing, Dustin said it, Sherry said it, and I'll say it too, which is they're conceptual. Um, but specifically, the land acquired by the project for transit parking, and you'll see parking is called for a few locations, some at each station, is intended to be used as parking. 
depending on local plans adopted by city and town jurisdictions, market conditions, transit agency procedures, and approval by the FTA, transit commuter parking may be redeveloped into transit supportive land uses. These drawings are a conceptual illustration of how the parking areas may be redeveloped by the municipal jurisdiction. Transit use of any redeveloped property will be retained and protected and is subject to the review of the FTA. Oh my gosh, okay, a lot, lot of boilerplate there. So, and then two other notes. Um, so these plans are conceptual plans for future land uses and may not reflect what is constructed on opening day or day one of the train, train opening. And then the second part of that is, as part of the new starts application process, those of you who have, may have met with uh, uh, Nick D's consultant, HDR, um, you'll see their plans and our plans don't necessarily match up yet, so, but as part of the new starts application, they'll have to be coordinated uh, between Nick D and RDA. So that's in the future. So first station I wanna talk to you about is the Munster Ridge Road Station. You'll see here is uh, Ridge and the Monon Trail and the proposed train alignment. You'll see a half mile radius and don't, don't lose any sleep over the fact that whether your house is in or outside the circle, it is just a planning convention to ask the question, kind of what's, the, what's a reasonable area people will walk to get to the train and a half mile is a pretty good, uh, as the crow flies, way to do that. Allie, do you wanna take, is this your spot? Not yet, okay. Okay, right, so one thing that happened since the last time we saw you is based on community input and I think some transit analysis, right, both, um, the proposed station at Ridge Road moved, moved from the south, uh, south end of, south side of Ridge Road to the north side. So we've moved, so here's Ridge, you can see it was there and it's now moved uh, to the north side. People have followed that and uh, hopefully that makes sense. So the market findings, um, and this is from uh, Strategic Economics from Berkeley, one is there's not a lot of land for development anyway. We're not taking anyone's house. Everyone that has a house owns that house and continues to own that house. So we're looking at just the land that is not built on now. There's not a lot of it. But there are some opportunities. So there's a very strong housing market. Those of you who, by the way, who lives around close to this station? Number of people, great. Um, really nice, really strong housing fabric. Anyway, there's a strong housing market with a recently built four-story multifamily development. Um, there's a strong market potential for mixed use housing, which would be housing above commercial uses. Um, and then the uh, retail, there's the potential, uh, the market study concluded to intensify that retail. That is to sell more stuff or to have more square footage of retail in this, in this sub area. Um, and then specifically the TOD development opportunities um, in terms of housing types, what might work here and what there might be developer demand and frankly homeowner demand for townhouses and lower density multifamily. Um, there would be some demand for four-story housing along Ridge and Calumet. That'd be the kind of tallest we'd look at. And then as I said, retail and office both along Ridge and along Calumet. So I think this is, this is where I get to hand over to Allie to describe this scheme. Thank you. Excuse me, someone's talking in the back. Could you hold it down, please? I know, but still, someone's talking in the back. I'm asking them. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we kept from the first scheme that no one particularly liked the overall scheme, but what people did hold on to is that we kept the Monon Trailhead there, which is the semicircle plaza with the fountain. On the second one, people liked the residential park on the Park Hills along Manor, which are the, the ones in the north of Manor. And for the third one, um, putting what we call an outlot building in front of Wood Ridgewood Plaza, and that's just adding additional street frontage and additional retail to that area. And then looking at a series of infill buildings along Ridge Road. So there's a couple commercial properties that are for sale and a couple commercial properties that we propose things on um, that we would not do without the building owner's consent, but it's just kind of an idea for an exercise in that. So, these are the bullet points for the scheme that you are about to see, the preferred TOD vision plan based on feedback from the last public meeting. Um, the station has moved north of Ridge Road. The commuter parking lot is now west of Manor and is north of Ridge Road on the green parkway. The Monon Trailhead is preserved. There's some infill residential north of the Nick D commuter uh, parking lot. And then again, we have redeveloped select commercial properties along Ridge Road. Mid-block 
cross across the manor, but not have to go down to Ridge Road. Um, it, you'll be able to see it on the boards later, but there's improved pedestrian and bicycle connections across the ridge. So that's a really important intersection for the Mona Trail, as well as residents living south of Ridge Road who would want to access the trail. Um, you'll see these four select park, um, properties here. So this is the outlet building. So what that means is you just kind of put a building in the parking lot, and that would add street frontage to both ridge and manor there. This building is a mixed-use residential building. It replaces two existing restaurants. It would take the cooperation of both property owners to put something like that there. Um, these two buildings are both for sale right now. We're proposing in addition to this uh, commercial development here. Again, mixed-use on the ground floor. Um, so this one would have um, commercial and retail on the ground floor, and then it would have residential above it, looking about 36 units. Um, and then again, another mixed use development here, about 22 uh, apartment units or condo units. And here's 22 units of compounds. So some constraints here, like I, like I said, is this would take a couple of property owners coming, to, coming together, some coordination. And um, you know, for better or worse, you would be crossing the block here without a signal. Right, so the second site, <coughs> excuse me, is the Munster Dyer Station. And I think you, everyone should know where this is. Main Street, this is Sheffield, this is Columbia. Um, and then the state line is right there at the kind of left edge of the plan. So market findings. First of all, constraints. Um, the available land is zoned, currently zoned for large lot single family, which uh, we've talked about transit oriented development a fair amount in the prior meetings, but it's worth mentioning here. Um, TOD tends to favor more compact, smaller lots and some attached housing. Um, and that, that helps families because they tend to be more affordable than large lot uh, homes. But anyway, uh, that's what the current zoning is. Second is that Nick, Nick D is aware that there are challenges in the plan with getting to and from the proposed uh, TOD parking, which is located west. We'll show you where that is. Uh, but that they'll be paying attention to that to improve that condition as the plans evolve going forward. So two opportunities. There's a lot of vacant land, certainly uh, west of the station. Um, and so there's a lot of development potential there. And then uh, the station, uh, the land next to the station is really well positioned for housing. So uh, those are good opportunities we're going to exploit. So and then specifically the building types, the TOD development opportunities, mixed use development, at the intersection of Calumet and Main Street, which is further, further east. And then um, near the station, uh, the market study concluded townhouses and lower density multifamily um, housing up to three stories with surface parking, not with decked parking or any, or underground parking or any kind of um, high cost parking scenarios. So, Allie? And similar to how we did it for Munster Ridge, we looked at your feedback from the last public meeting and 60% of the participants favored the second station in the middle, but it's pretty close with 40% looking at the third station. And so we really combined a lot of those two elements. So the first one, uh, this decision isn't necessarily ours as much as Nikki and HDR, but they're using a switchback ramp for the pedestrian underpass um, that you'll be able to see in a little bit more detail on our board. Um, from the second one, we kept the large park on the east, which is right here. It's just smaller than the football field for reference. Um, we kept multiple access points off of Columbia slash Sheffield, and then we proposed development on the seminary parcel. Again, this is one of those conditions where it would require the person who's owning the seminary parcel to want to do this, but it's uh, an exercise in showing what could go there. And on the third scheme, we kept the West Park and the surrounding development and the parking that was pushed west. So of these things, to recap, the station and platform are still on the east side of the tracks. That has not moved. Um, Bar Associates has pushed the commuter parking west toward the state line to open up development space near the station area. There is a pedestrian underpass to connect the parking to the station and to the east side of the station area. We have also proposed pedestrian and bicycle bridges on um, the west side of the tracks. So right now there isn't a route there, but we're looking at if there were a route to be extended somewhere through Dyer, through Munster, um, how we could accommodate that. 
And then we are also looking at future TU development on the agricultural lands of the northeast of community estates. Again, we have to work with the landowner. And we don't show any specific development for that as much as just something to look at moving forward. So to orient you, this is where Main Street ends right now. This is Main and Sheffield. And this Main Street will go underneath this bridge. And we are proposing that you would enter into the parking lot back here. And this street does not connect to Seminary Drive right now, and it does not connect to Margo Lane. They are aligned, but you cannot turn into it. Um, so the park on the left is 1.2 acres, again, about the size of a football field. And the park on the east is 1.4 acres, slightly larger. We have a mix of housing types here. We have a series of these small things that you see are townhomes. They appear throughout. Um, we have some higher density residential with no retail due to the market study timing. And we also have larger multi-story buildings uh, off of Main Street. Uh, and what we're proposing up here is having intersections. So this would be a new street in through a boulevard that would allow you to drop someone off at the train track and loop back out. So there's one new street here and another new street here. And we're also looking at connecting this street through to this large agricultural parcel, and that's kind of just looking forward to future development. If that person did want to redevelop that property, how would it connect to this development as well? Yeah. And as part of the larger stormwater strategy in all schemes, we're looking at what we can do with rainwater and how we can leverage our infrastructure to accommodate that. And so this is an example of a stormwater street in High Point, Seattle. And what they did is they allowed, they, oh, um, they widened the planting strip and they set them up in what they call cells to track stormwater and let it slowly percolate into the ground. This helps not overwhelm the sewer system and it um, kind of makes it beautiful. It doesn't have to be a large detention ditch all the time. It's how can we kind of spread it out, make it beautiful, make it enjoyable and manageable. So that's just something that we're looking at exploring as we get further into this design process. Perfect, so now recommended zoning framework. So I want to repeat now that I have a microphone and you can probably hear me, that this is not a zoning change. This is um, a recommendation that we are making to RDA to um, include in the New Starts application to indicate that the towns of Munster and Dyer are intending to pursue something about transit-oriented development regulations in the future. So but let me take you through it. So there's three ways. You know, one thing everyone wants when you get development is that you are assured that the quality will be good. So, um, so here's, here's the question we pose. How can the quality be regulated to make sure that the outcome you wanted actually happen. So I don't know if people know a lot about zoning, but it is the set of rules that govern land and, and what you're allowed to build on a piece of land and how large a building can be and all sorts of requirements. So we call that conventional zoning. And so typically that will put like a cake mold. I think of it as like a cake mold over the top of your property and say you can do kind of whatever you want within this with this cake mold. Then the second level up is called design guidelines, and they're voluntary, and they begin to suggest to a developer or a builder or somebody seeking to improve that land by putting a building on it, what, what the appearance of that building could be, completely voluntary. And then the third one we're gonna talk about and what we are recommending is what we call sort of a walkable code, also called a form-based code. So you'll hear more from me on that in a minute. So conventional zoning um, is a kind of poor tool for assuring quality. All it does is permits, it regulates typically the bulk of a building, how many square feet you can do. It regulates the height of the building, how tall it can be in terms of the number of stories. But in terms of does it face the street, is the entrance facing the sidewalk or the parking lot, all those kinds of things, conventional zoning isn't good, a tool, good tool to do that. So we aren't recommending that. The second choice is design guidelines. Now these are voluntary. So if you're a, if we want high quality development and you're a developer, let's say, you come in and you say, well, are these required? And the town has to say, well, actually, no, they're simply voluntary, they're advisory. So there's often a kind of negotiation that draws out a, kind of an unpleasant process where the town feels like they're gonna get something good because they have guidelines, but the developer sees the guidelines as voluntary and disregards them. 
So this is kind of the worst of all possible worlds. To me, you think you're getting something good, and the, the applicant isn't required to do what you thought they had to do, which is why we favor the form-based codes, and I'll talk to you more about that. So, so this is a kind of comparison between this new thing, new, 20 years old, 25 years old, form-based codes, also called abbreviated FBC versus conventional zoning. So um, what I like to say about it is that it simplifies approvals for good development. So if you're a developer and you want to do what we asked you to do, you know, I say if you meet our standards and you've done a good job, you get a permit. Don't have to negotiate, don't have to hire 20 lawyers to do that. If you're doing the right thing, you're good to go. And that's, I think, a good posture for, for this plan to have. Second one is, um, if you've ever read a zoning document and you're not an attorney, <coughs> your eyes can often glaze over. So uh, form-based codes allow diagrams, kind of like pictures, with notes on them to take the place of text and to be legally binding. And the third thing is will uh, form-based codes tends to emphasize building form over use. Now what the heck does that mean? So, so let's just say, um, uh, you know, uh, if you build a building that, that sits well on a street, but you have an at-home business, for example, you're doing tax prep, or you take in sewing, or you're a computer consultant, or whatever, you work out of your home, we don't, we, if in the right place, we don't care about that. If the form fits the neighborhood, and your building is a good neighbor, and you don't generate foot traffic, that's fine by us. That's an example of concern with the form over the specifics of the use. But there's, use is still regulated. Um, the other thing is uh, parking maximums. A lot of zoning requires, it'll say, you need to, you developer need to provide, you know, five parking spaces per thousand square feet of building. Sometimes that means you have more land devoted to, to parking than to building. So it's very hard to get a lot of return, economic return on the train investment when you do that. So TOD will often set a parking maximum rather than a minimum. So that's a kind of, you know, kind of makes your head explode thinking about it but it works pretty well across the country in TOD uh, areas. And then this last one is called the build to zone. We're often, if you're familiar with zoning, oftentimes there's a minimum setback. It'll say you can't build your house closer than 30 feet to the front property line. This says, no, 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 um, there's a zone. First of all, we want you to not set back so far. We'd rather you be closer to the street or the sidewalk, but you have some flexibility in where you do that. So hence the zone. So that's what that's about. So here's an example. This is not anything we propose for you, but this is a pro prior project of ours showing you how form-based code FBC could be transit-supportive zoning. So there's two kind of tools that, that make this up. One is the regulating plan. So this is, imagine this is the parcel we'll see in a minute. So this is land. It's been classified under different zoning types. You can see the colors there, sort of yellow, col multiple colors of red, some blue, and so on. So those, that's how the land gets allocated. And then you go over to this chart here and you say, let's say I own that parcel there and it looks like it's maybe that color, I can't quite read it, that color there. And I look at this chart and so I own this thing, I can build any of these one, two, three, four building types as of right, get a permit right away, and then two others with a special use permit, I can get those. So what it does is, um, from the community point of view, we know what menu of buildings are permitted on each of these lots. From the developer standpoint, if in 2022, when I want to build my first building, that there's a market for that, but not for that, cool, I can still build that. So the, the zoning didn't paint me into a corner to require me to build something that the market doesn't want that year. So anyway, it's a combination of sort of design control, so you get the quality plus the flexibility <clears throat> to respond to the market. So this is just an example. This is way too advanced, but I want to show it to people because it's kind of interesting and I think it's a good conversation. Maybe you'll have some feedback for us tonight uh, in this session. But So if you've ever read a zoning code, um, you'll often see if you, if you want to build a building, you have to go to one chapter for the parking, one chapter for the bulk, one chapter for the setbacks, one chapter for the use. What we try and do here is to get let's say that's the building you want to build right there, kind of what's called a live-work building prototype, right? Um, that's the little diagram that communicates what it looks like. Here's all the regulations that govern it, the plan. Uh, you know, there's one with an alley, one without, one with detached garages, one with attached garages, the heights, the facade. It's all on a two-page spread. So you're not hunting around a 200-page document trying to find out what I can do and what I can't do. What this does is it brings, to me, I think it's a very democratic document because it brings forward to anybody to be able to figure out wow, I'm looking at this map and the lot, you know, on my corner, 
they can build one of these. Okay, well, what will that be? Well, the height will be told there, the building placement will be there, the facade there, and so on and so on. So there's great transparency and predictability. So that's, that's what we like about it. So, and these range of building types, this comes out of the market study and just out of practice, right? So we've described here nine different building types that might be under consideration. I think that lower left is taller than the market study and probably taller than we'd recommend, so that may drop off. But you can see here's uh, nine different building types. Here's photographs of those. If you don't like the drawings, here's photographs of all those nine different building types. And so our job is to allocate where on the plan each of these would be permitted. So that's kind of how that goes. Um, and as I said, all of this is probably more detailed than you care to know, but it's an important part of a competitive application for the New Starts process. That is to say that the towns are thinking about how they will regulate their land use in the future, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if, if and when the train uh, shows up. So, and so this, this is our specific, more specific um, example for uh, Munster and Dyer. I think this is the Munster stop, is that right, Allie? Um, so anyway, we have fewer building types here, but you can read them, civic and institutional, mixed use, one-story retail, mid-rise and courtyard, four to six unit buildings, live, work, and then townhouse and duplex. So, and so these would be the building types, and then here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different zones and what is permitted um, in, in them. And so you can see this one, mixed use flex, permits all seven of these building types, as does mixed use parking. So, but then the mixed use retail, only a few, and then here for more residential, only the residential. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so here's how that might play out. And the, again, to orient you, this is um, Ridge here. And here's the Monon Trail and Manor Ave. And so you can see we're proposing sort of mixed use buildings, the blue in a plus lighter blue here, darker blue there. So we'll go back and show you lighter blue there allows the more commercial buildings. Um, and then the darker blue the same. And then here along uh, Ridge, we've got the kind of violet or purple, whatever color that is. That's this guy here, mixed use flex. And so that would say any of those seven building types along there are permitted in there. Um, and then the last category, whoops, sorry, last category is this sort of ochre and a little bit of tan there. And so that would be the attached residential mid-scale. So those four building types there, and then the lower rise, just three of those building types. So, so that's kind of how you think about it. So we love your feedback on this. If we've got something right or wrong or whatever, please tell us what you think. And then for the other station, the other one that Ali described, and this is again a draft, see the word draft, so it's really Oh, subject to change. So you see the mixed use there at the intersection of Maine and Calumet, which is what the market study said, there's some opportunity to intensify the development there. Um, and so the, the other commercial, let's go back to here. Uh, so those three building types, institutional, mixed use, or one-story commercial are permitted in the blue zones. And the uh, ochre and the tan again are the residential uh, types. Um, and then green stands for park. Um, and so this is the kind of, uh, you know, regulatory framework we're going to recommend. It will not be binding. It will not govern anyone's land use decisions uh, anytime soon. But we will be making the recommendation that the town, <laughs> that the town, uh, that the town um, incorporate this and say to say to, uh, in, in their new sorts application, that they intend to pursue a process like this. So next steps, next steps. We're at an open house. So what we're gonna do, I think, is to turn on the lights. Does that sound about right? And um, if there are any clarifying questions, not policy questions, but if anything I was unclear about that you could ask a question and I could explain to everybody, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, uh, but any opinions you want to express, you know, do that around the room. Any clarifying questions of any sort? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so how much question if everybody, oh, don't, please don't open it yet. Whoops. Let me see. So the question was how much parking. So there's two types of parking. There's parking for transit riders, and then there's parking to support a building or a development. So when we show any of these yellow boxes, for example, see where the building is, that white remainder of the parcel is where the cars would be parked for that building. And then out here is where we're talking about, say, this is again the, uh, the Main Street station. 
I have a bucket of water. If you want to drop it in there, we can just put it out of its misery. That poor cow. My gosh. My gosh. <laughs> um, so at this station, here's where the, the transit parking is proposed to be. So this is, you know, Main Street would be extended. This is the uh, Illinois state line right there. So the comment was made, uh, Nick D is aware that there's, you know, kind of a challenge because there's one way in and one way out to get to that parking, but that's where it's proposed to be. The parking? So these connections. So we have lined the streets up for a future connection, but there is a strong guidance both from Dyer and Munster not to make the connection now. But we, we, I'll just say that we have, um, you know, I am doing my job well if I align them so that if you change your mind in the future, you don't close the door. So, but we, they are not connected now, and that we are not proposing to. Pam. Um, explain it a little more. Dustin's dying to talk to you about it. So, sir. With respect to parking, yeah. how would you prevent uh, other commuters from the surrounding areas from parking in neighborhoods such as Westlake? So we don't we don't have any regulations on it, but I'll say that across the country there is, if that's a concern, um, the my advice is to have ready a fallback plan if it becomes an issue. Yeah. I think but a fallback plan just just not yeah, necessary. Go, go ahead, please this do. Is, this is really worried about some old stuff. Neighborhood parking. And everyone gets a pass. You're, you live in West Lakes. Here, we can see that you live in West Lakes. If you're on the street and you don't have a West Lakes pass, you get a ticket. Okay. That, that, I guess that what we do not want is people uh, parking in West Lakes and then dropping down there, right? Yeah. Hey, She's absolutely right. Because I've lived in Chicago for 20 years, and I can tell you firsthand that happens on a regular basis. Yeah. So I was going to say there's a second, so Dustin covered the first strategy. The second strategy, I'm still answering his question, so I'll, we're here till 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever you want to do. So the second strategy that some municipalities around the country have done is they will um, have what Dustin said and then have uh, permit only. People that don't live in the neighborhood can pay to park on the street there and the proceeds go to the homeowners association or the local whatever. So. So it's a revenue source, and you could say no to that. I'm just saying, but you have mostly the streets, the on-street parking in many neighborhoods is not used much. People have driveways or garages, and so it's vacant sitting there all day. So the, the communities that get new transit say, goodness, someone will pay me $100 to park in that space. And if ever, we collected them all, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you what other places do. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just. You're disagreeing with me before I've finished a sentence. So let me just say it works plenty of other places. You disagree, that's fine. So that's plan B. Um, we've heard, I just want to hear, I'll get back over here. This is a half mile radius, which would take you to the, looks like the far edge of the parking lot. Would we all agree on that? Something like that? Yeah, that's like 10 minutes to there. So from the middle, let's call it seven or eight minutes from there to there. And then the underpass would be another minute or two. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. Yeah, 88 goes, yeah, thank you for asking. 88, uh, like a minute. So the 88 parking, we have to kind of put right next to the 
platform, platform, we think that's only fair. It would be weird to have the ADA parking force people to go under the underpass. Allie. Actually, so that's our, that's our adding ADA parking. McDee's ADA parking uh, is actually located down here. And so they have a separate parking lot with ADA stalls and then a pedestrian bridge that would take you over Main Street up to the platform. So we've basically tried to add a second <clears throat> talking about the, the parking, yeah. So far away, as well as the ADA parking being across the street, actual Yeah, well, so the ADA parking, you know, I think there are rules and, and requirements that both of these locations for the ADA parking meet. So we're within kind of standards. Um, and I think uh, to, I'll just say to HDR's credit or NICD's credit, they weren't kind of getting into the TOD planning business. This is land that they intend to acquire, so they were doing, kind of proposing on land they had some plans of for, right? I mean, why wouldn't you just put it next to the station? Well, so they are, right, so the, so NICD is not acquiring <laughs> any of this land. So that's why I say we are, we are drawing and asking forgiveness rather than permission to make these, these suggestions on this land. We don't own any of it. I will never own any of it. So they're right in putting it there because we can count on it being actually appearing there. This this is part of, this is someone's That's private Nick land. That's Nick D. That's Nick D too? Where's Alice? There, okay, I misspoke. So Nick D has that, okay. Uh, and then here, the, the question you're trying to kind of visualize it from the point of view of a park and ride person. We are trying to promote development next to the station. So if you put the development behind the parking, it will never happen. But the parking behind the development will happen. So that's 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 is kind of is this being done elsewhere? All over all over the place. Can you just provide just a couple of examples? Um, we've shown them in previous meetings. We could pull them out again, but um, there's lots of places where the the parking is a walk through a development. So, uh, well uh, a walk through development. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well so, so all I would say is we see a value in this development. And maybe maybe you'd rather have it be no, surface parking. I mean, yeah. I'm yeah. yeah. not Okay. This was ours, so I'll, I can more detail than you're asking for, but when we interviewed for this project, and we've done a lot of TOD plans around Chicago, and there's some, there's some debate amongst professionals, but time and again, we are hired by a town that has a surface parking lot like that right next to the station, and they say, please make it into development because we're, we're not getting any revenue from all these people parking here. They pay $2 to park for the day, and they don't spend a dollar in our town, and they're just causing traffic. That's not adding value to our town. Turn it into development, make them residents, and we say, well, actually, rare indeed is the example where a parking lot built in that location is ever replaced. It happens rarely, and there's a debate within our team about that, but I assert to you, show me the example in a market of this strength where that's happened, and that's a hard find. So that's why I say, if you ever want this to, develop, to be development, don't put the parking there, because it'll never go away in my experience, 25 years. Gray, see this gray hair? See this gray hair? I earned this gray hair. No, I have that Yeah, oh no, no, you don't. I have color. Okay. But so what you're seeing is the idea is essentially force the commuters to walk through the community so that they stop the dry cleaning off or get a yeah. or, 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 or buy a <coughs> unit. And Move into it. Well, no one, no one wants to buy the unit across a parking lot from a train station. Why you buy it here is, you know, like I can walk from my house to a nice park and lightly traveled streets and it's quite pleasant. It's a pedestrian, it's a rewarding pedestrian experience, that's all. If you were a developer, 
here, maybe, maybe I said it too glibly, let me repeat it. If you were a developer and you could build this, right, this is easier to market and to sell than if the parking lot and the development were switched. Does that make sense? Good for development. So these are, yeah, and this is, you know, new, uh, you know, new townhouse. Yeah. Parking lot is for how this town is. Right. These are tax these are taxpayer residents. These would be residents of Munster, taxpayers in Munster. Right? Um, like, so for example, my husband lives downtown and we don't we wouldn't live within walking distance, so we would end up parking in the Oh I have a resident of Munster. Yeah, I would so be parking. I would okay. <laughs> Here? Down, down, down here. Where the community estates is. Why wasn't that? Here? Yes. Which is more accessible to me. Yes, yeah, so during the EIS process, that was an option um, that was considered and uh, was not favored. So I think there's, am I right? Favored by Munster? By Nifty and by. You want to correct me here? Okay. Yes, but you're paying ten million dollars to build a tunnel underneath, as opposed to the land that actually ultimately is. Even though that land is cheaper, you're paying ten million to build a tunnel to access that parking lot, which you can't come into the land right there for ten million dollars. So um, I've just been added some facts here, always good to have facts, so I'll provide this one. So the town of Munster voted to direct NICTI and their consultants to locate the parking west of the tracks. So yeah, that is that why, okay, yeah, and that happened months ago, right? Like years ago? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. sorry if we seem sort of cobwebby about your question. We, Get you under the tracks, which you need to do because the platform's on the east side of the tracks. Yeah, right. Right, right. Right. Sandra, you want to take this? <laughs> During opening days, the parking will be directly next to the station because that is the land that we're purchasing, and we would be purchasing the project moving forward to support the parking. So, what Doug is going through at this point are potential future uses, potentially, of the parking um, for if development plan actually is, uh, presents itself, and we do believe that it will be. For day one, the parking will be will be developed right next to the station. So, so effectively, we have to provide parking for the FTA New Starts program for opening day, as well as for um, 2020, 2040, 2040. So we have to show that we can provide that amount of parking, and that we have our that we are in control of land that will supply that amount of parking. So this TOD would be an overlay to that. Um, in the future, but day one, the parking will be located right at the station. This would be um, in the future development. We could do structured parking. We'd have to replace the parking if we, if we, um, if the development happened, we would need to replace that parking in the future. So we need to supply the parking for commuters. So it'd be on the east side of the station. So the parking would be on the west side, as per the, the Munster resolution from last year. Any other clarifying questions? Because uh, yeah. I do want to do the open house. Maybe last one, sir. Yeah. Change the subject a little bit. Didn't Lauren just say that no 
As part of the TOD, yeah. That's correct. So just to clarify, there's the, the rail line, right. Correct. So everything we're showing here that's yellow, that looks like new development, is private sector, you know, by developers. So, uh, you know, if we, if we show development that, you know, for example, this whole bid here is on land owned by somebody, I think maybe a developer, right? Either that developer Community would... Foundation. Community Foundation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the community foundation would have to be a developer or they would have to <coughs> sell to a developer, but there's no plans, no discussions going on, so yes. So there's a private... It's, it's all private. It's all private property or whatever. There's a little house and there's something here. You know, there's no way that they can come in and say you have to... No, no. <laughs> Ma'am? So the question is, um, are those two hundred and fifty units are those apartments? Yes, so any time that says units, that means a dwelling unit. So does TOD ever take into account that there's five hundred uh, units or so and let's say each person has a child? Are there any areas that they just sort of create pools on that area? So that would be a town of Munster decision. School, so no, we have not looked at schools in this case. Thank you. Okay. Any other, <clears throat> any other clarifying questions? The question is, is this seminary land, this parcel here? We think it's owned by the seminary. Right. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we no, we're Again, not buying. We have anything. not bought any right. land that we have shown residential development on. As Doug was saying, this would all be done by a private developer. No one will come in and steal your house or take your house to do this TV development. It's an exercise for a future vision of what someone, if they should choose to sell the property, could have built on it. And the buildings. Yes. So what we're showing at the top of the seminary is a series of townhomes and a couple of uh, two, maybe three-story multifamily. So, that is a great open house question. So, because um, I'm more concerned about the other station, because yeah. I'm from that neck of the woods, okay. and we got some units there too. If you're talking about building buildings, are we talking apartments here or are we talking ownership? Uh, we don't specify. So. Why, that's, that is as good. I've been urged by four people to shift to the uh, open house. So maybe this is a good time to do that. So if you have Doug any. Doug is not going anywhere. He will continue to be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With or without a microphone, I'm, I'll be here. So. I have one more question that I was looking to answer. Just because I think it's a combination between yourself and the Justin and the council members. We talked a lot about change to land use regulations of the municipality, right? So any change to the land use regulations to the municipality, Munster, Dyer, and anywhere in India, starts at the plan commission. So there's usually uh, a meeting, then there's a public hearing, so there's an opportunity for public to comment. Uh, I cannot imagine uh, it, this being two meetings at the plan commission. This is probably a months long process. And then the plan commission would some send some recommended piece of legislation uh, after a public hearing, multiple public hearings, to the town council in the form of a proposed ordinance. And a proposed ordinance has at least two years. I 
think it's very common for something of that magnitude to have multiple hearings and multiple readings. Uh, and it took us, uh, Pam, with the phone, how many meetings did we have just for a resolution? A few, so for something bigger than uh, a resolution, something that would actually be uh, binding law in ordinance for what people can do with their private rider is a really, really big deal. And it's not something anybody on town council or who works for town council talk, takes lightly at all. So it would be a, a very public and uh, participatory process. So after your, all your meetings, the planning commission, there's a recommendation to town council, a series of meetings, a long series of meetings of the town council, likely, depending on public turnout, right? And then they would vote on it, and then it would become an ordinance, right? So how does that even start, right? So I'm, I'm not that right. I don't have the ability to draw a form-based code out of thin air. What the town would do before we even start on the planning commission would ask the town council, would you like to undergo this exercise and consider looking at a form-based code? And then what does a form-based code look like? going to be a process very similar, uh, probably a little bit more labor intensive than local, specifically to Munster, our jurisdiction, with a firm that does land use and planning. So they will have conversations just like this where they say, what do you want? What's the form? What's the ball? What's the scale? What's the use? Build two, you know, maximum parking. All these kinds of questions will be ferreted out and discussed and shredded on boards and conversations like this, and they'll just like tonight, give a final product. And then that would be brought to the plan, plan commission. This is a very long, detailed process. So the intention is to get the ball rolling and moving forward with it. I mean, keep, keep the sense of it, okay, as an option, and this is the best practice. And I'm guessing you know, the town, is that the intention? You still have the people, people who are going in. I mean, it would be uh, silly for me to assume the intention to buy an independent elected officials. I can tell you that I will, I will bring it to their attention and say, I think you should consider doing this exercise. And if they agree or not, uh, it's, uh, it's up to the five of them. But I do think it is a good idea to have a plan, rather than not have a plan, and just let things happen. So I would imagine it would be. I mean, I, 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 I get, Um, and so please leave your comments on a sticky note and ask any questions that you have of us. Thank you. 